Hello and welcome to Daily News Simplified, an analysis of the Hindi newspaper from UPSC perspective. Today we will discuss the Delhi edition of the Hindi newspaper dated 10th December 2019. And the articles that we will discuss today are displayed on your screen. So let us start our discussion. Now this article on page number 1 talks about India's improvement in the ranking in the UN Development Index. And this Development Index is the Human Development Index. So in the recently published Human Development Report of the UNDP, India's rank has improved by one place. So this shall become important for us from the General Studies paper too under the topic Social Justice. And if you look at this discussion of the GS mains question, we have discussed the question that was asked in the General Studies paper too in the mains examination related to the topic Human Development. And the question reads, despite consistent experience of high growth, India still goes with the lowest indicators of human development. Examine the issues that make balanced and inclusive development elusive in India. And in this discussion, we have discussed the various hindrances to the improvement in human development in India. So in this article, what we will do is that we will try to compare between the Human Development Index, which is published by the UNDP, with that of the Human Capital Index, which is published by the World Bank. And that aspect will become extremely important for us from the preliminary examination point of view. After that, we will look at what are the key highlights of this present report. And ultimately, we will discuss some of the questions which will give you an idea as to which kind of question can be asked in your preliminary examination related to these important indices. Now, if you go through the NCRT of class 11th of geography, that is the human geography, in its chapter number 4 related to human development, you will find the works of Nobel laureates Dr. Mehboob al Haq and Professor Amartya Sen. Now, Dr. Mehboob al Haq is a Pakistani economist and he was the one who created the Human Development Index in the year 1990. And according to him, the development is all about enlarging people's choices in order to lead long and healthy lives with dignity. And accordingly, the UN Development Program has used this concept of human development to publish the Human Development Report annually since 1990. So this Human Development Index which was created by Dr. Mehboob al Haq has been used by the UNDP. Further, Nobel Laureate Professor Amarth Sen saw an increase in the freedom or a decrease in the unfreedom as the main objective of development. And according to him, increasing freedoms is also one of the most effective ways of bringing out development. Now, as both Dr. Mehboob al Haq and Professor Amartya Sen have stressed on increasing the choices of the people and increasing the freedom of the people, and accordingly, they have defined the approach for development as capability approach. And this approach is associated with Professor Amartya Sen, and he further highlights that building human capabilities in the areas of health, education, and access to resources is the key to increasing human development. And accordingly, this highlights the importance of education for the development as has been defined under the capability approach which was given by Professor Amartya Sen. Let us look at what is this Human Capital Index and also the Human Development Index which was created by Dr. Mehboob al Haq. And if you go through the prelims compass of the economic development, you will find the difference between the HDI and the HCI and what are the key aspects of the Human Capital Index and both can be extremely important for us from the preliminary examination point of view. So regarding the Human Development Index, you should note that it is measured by the UN Development Program. However, the Human Capital Index is measured and released by the World Bank. Further, this Human Development Index is a summary measure of the average achievement in the key dimensions of human development and these include a long and healthy life, being knowledgeable and having a standard of or a decent standard of living. So in short, it measures the present level of human development. However, as far as this human capital index is concerned, it measures the amount of human capital that a child born today can expect to attain by the age of 18 years. So as compared to the human development index, it is more of a potential or the future level of human development which can be expected from the investment in education and health. And that is why the World Bank has decided to remove this learning poverty by half by the year 2030. And that is because it is important for human capital formation. Now, what are the parameters that are used in calculating the HDI? 
So it includes the life expectancy index, which is measured by the life expectancy at birth. It includes education index, which is measured by expected years of schooling and mean years of schooling. And thirdly, it includes the standard of living, which is measured by per capita income. Now here it should be noted that the HDI did not include the quality of learning as a parameter in the calculation of human development index. Now compared to this, the three parameters for the human capital index include the survival, which is measured by under five mortality, expected years of quality adjusted school, which is measured by both the quantity of education as well as the quality of the education. And this quality is measured by a major international student achievement testing programs that includes the program for international student assessment that is PISA by the OECD. And the quantity of education is measured by the number of years of school that a child can expect to obtain by the age of 18. And as far as the health environment is concerned, it is measured by the adult survival rate and rate of stunting of children under the age of 5. So these are key points of comparison between the Human Development Index and the Human Capital Index. And according to the recent index, India has a human capital score of about 0.44 only and it ranks as low as 115 among the total 157 countries. Further, the global human capital score is only about 0.56. Now, as the human capital formation has been low across the world, which has been highlighted by this HCI or the human capital index, the World Bank has targeted to reduce the learning poverty by almost half by the year 2000. Now, regarding the present human development report, it highlights that India has ranked at 129 amongst the 189 countries in 2019 on the Human Development Index. And there are other revelations, for example, in the year 2016, India ranked at 131. After that, its rank improved to 130 and then it improved to 129. And the report further highlights that the overall index showed that India scored 0.647 in the year 2018 as against 0.643 in the year 2017. So this is a misprint in this infographic. So please ignore it. Further in India, 271 million people were lifted out of poverty from the year 2005 and 6 to 2015 and 16. And in this, the biggest contribution was done by the Jandhan Yojana and the Ayushman Bharat Yojana. So it reads that the Jandhan Yojana and the Ayushman Bharat are crucial in ensuring vision of development for all. And on the Gender Inequality Index, India ranks at 122 out of 162 countries in the year 2018. So after this, let us look at some of the observations of this report and the performance of India on several indicators under the Human Development Index. Now the title of this year's report is Beyond Income, Beyond Averages and Beyond Today. And it highlights the inequalities in human development in the 21st century. So the main focus of this year's human development report is the inequality in the societies across the world. So in this background, the key takeaways of the report include that the world has progressed in reducing the extreme deprivations. So for example, the world has progress in removing the poverty, etc. However, the income disparities are still widespread and these inequalities can be seen between the countries and also within the countries. For example, there are certain countries which have high level of human development as compared to that of other countries. And such variation in human development can also be seen within a country itself. Further highlighting the issue of inequality, the report states that Inequalities in the human development is taking a new dimension and that will have a long term generational impact. So the impact of this inequality will be very long term as highlighted by this report. Further, it reads that inequalities are more social as compared to that of economic. And as a result, they accumulate through the life across generations due to deeply embedded power imbalance. And in order to fight the inequalities, the need of the R is evidence-based policy making. And that is why the title of the report has been the Beyond Income, Beyond Averages and Beyond Today. Now, Beyond Income means that to include other aspects that lead to human development besides the three aspects that are considered under the Human Development Index. Further, Beyond Today means to include the factors 
that will lead to inequalities in the 22nd centuries. So overall, there should be awareness and there is a need to include all those factors which can further increase this problem of inequality. And finally, beyond averages is to include new dimensions of enhanced capabilities. So to factor in the issue of inequality, the report has been titled Beyond Income, Beyond Averages and Beyond Today. Now regarding India's performance, you should note that India has improved its ranking from 130 last year to 129 this year. Now compared to India's neighbors and other important countries, Sri Lanka stood at 71, China at 85, Bhutan at 134, Bangladesh at 135, Myanmar at 145, Nepal 147, Pakistan 152 and Afghanistan 170. Which means that India stands substantially above Bhutan, Bangladesh, Myanmar, Nepal, Pakistan and Afghanistan. However, its human development performance is lower as compared to Sri Lanka and China. Further, between the period 1990 to 2018, India's score has improved from 0.431 to 0.647. And in the same period, on the All Indicators of Human Development Index, India has improved its life expectancy at birth by 11.6 years, the average number of schooling years have been increased by 3.5 years, and per capita incomes have increased by more than 250 times. However, the issue of inequality can be seen in India also, and when these Human Development Indicators are adjusted for inequality, India's Human Development Score drops from 0.647 to 0.477. And regarding the issue of poverty in India, India is home to about 364 million poor people, which is about 28% of the total 1.3 billion poor people in the world. So these are the few highlights of the Human Development Report. And in this article, we have learned about the various aspects of HDI and the HCI and also some of the highlights of the Human Development Report. So after this, let us look at some of the preliminary questions which have been asked in the previous years and accordingly, they will give you an idea as to how to approach such questions related to important indices. And regarding the questions that are asked in the previous year, in the year 2014, the question asked about the organization which publishes the World Economic Outlook. So the correct answer is the International Monetary Fund. And in the year 2017, it asked about the Global Gender Gap Index. So it is produced by the World Economic Forum. Now in the year 2018, the question was related to the Rule of Law Index. And it is published by the World Justice Project. Now the question that was asked in 2012 required us to know about the factors on which the multidimensional poverty index is calculated. So the statements given are that it calculates the deprivation of education, health, assets and services at the household level. So this is a correct statement related to the multidimensional poverty index. However, the other two statements that were given were only given to confuse the students. So these were not the correct statements. So the correct answer in this case was only A, that is one only. So that is why the components of the human capital index are also important and you should learn these factors on which the human capital index is calculated. Now in the year 2018, a question was asked directly related to the human capital formation as a concept. So the question reads, human capital formation as a concept is better explained in terms of a process which enables. So the first statement reads, individuals of a country to accumulate more capital. Now it is incorrect because the human capital formation is more related to health and education and it is not related to the accumulation of capital in the hands of individuals of a country. Now the second statement reads, increasing the knowledge, skill levels and capacities of the people of country. Now this statement is correct because we know that increasing the knowledge, skill levels and capacities of a country will lead to the development of human capital. The third is the accumulation of tangible wealth. Now this statement is also incorrect because the human capital formation is related to the accumulation of intangible wealth. So this statement is correct. Now if you look at the options, the correct answer is C, that is 2 and 4. So to understand the human capital formation in detail, you should go through the chapter 5 of the class 11th NCRT, that is the Indian Economic Development. So this will give you a better understanding of the human capital formation as a concept. With this, let us move on to the next article. Now this editorial on page number 10 has been written in the context of a fire disaster that happened in Delhi in the Anaj Mandi area of Delhi. 
and this highlights the issue of misgovernance related to the issue of fire disasters. So this shall fall under general studies paper 3 under the topic disaster management. Now regarding the fire disasters you should note that it is a man-made disaster and such fire disasters take place because of various factors. For example at times the buildings do not have mandatory fire clearances and also in case of fire disasters there is lack of proper response from the authorities and in many cases the fire stations lack proper equipments manpower etc to handle the fire disasters so in this background what we will do is that we will try and understand some of the issues that were highlighted by the national disaster management agency and after that we will also look at some of the suggestions which have been provided by the National Disaster Management Agency to improve the fire disaster handling framework. Now highlighting the issues in the framework for handling fire disasters, the National Disaster Management Authority has said that there is lack of unified fire services in some of the states. Secondly, there is lack of proper organizational structure, training and career progression of its personnel. Thirdly, there is lack of adequate modern equipment and their scaling authorization and standardization and after that there is lack of appropriate and adequate funding also there is lack of training institutions for the fire safety workers and there are institutional facilities which are lacking like there is lack of fire stations and accommodation for the fire personnel further the authorities have been lacking in increasing the public awareness as to what are the do's and don'ts in the events of fires and also these authorities do not conduct regular mock exercises and evacuation drills to make the public aware. And finally, there is lack of uniform fire safety legislation in some of the states. Now, besides this, the report highlights the shortfall in various aspects of the fire stations, the firefighting vehicles and the fire personnel. So regarding the lack of fire stations, the report highlights that there is lack of 97.54 fire stations across the country. So the present situation is that only 3% of the areas are covered by fire stations across the country. Secondly, as far as the firefighting and rescue vehicles are concerned, there is lack of 80% of such vehicles. And then there is lack of 96% firefighting personnel in the fire stations. So these points highlight the gravity of problem of handling the fire disasters and accordingly there is lack of proper organizational structure etc and this is leading to misgovernance of the fire disasters and fire stations also. Now in order to improve this, the National Disaster Management Authority has suggested that for setting up a fire stations, some of the criteria that should be followed are as following. The first is that the response time of the fire station should be 3 to 5 minutes in the urban areas and it should be about 20 minutes in the rural areas. Further, the setting up of fire station should be based on the scale of population to be served. And also, there should be number of minimum standard equipment which are needed and manpower required for its operation. So these three criteria should be followed in setting up of any fire station in India. And after that, the National Disaster Management Agency has provided various action points that need to be taken care by the responsible agencies. For example, there should be enactment of a fire act. And as we have seen, there is lack of uniform fire legislations across the states in India. So in that case, such an act is the responsibility of the state government. And also, such act should identify the fire vulnerabilities in the states. And as such, these acts should be capable of handling the issues of fire disasters properly. Further, the act should provide a legal regime for mandatory clearances from the fire departments for buildings and premises that the state may consider hazardous and which require their own fire protection arrangements. And for example, in the present disaster that happened in Delhi, there was lack of proper clearances to these buildings which could have averted these events of fire disasters. And such acts should also provide for regular mock exercises and it should also ensure the maintenance of fire prevention systems, etc. It should also cover various aspects like the recruitment of personnel, their training and other infrastructure related aspects. The second important point here is the preparation of a comprehensive plan for revamping of fire service. 
and this is also the responsibility of state government or the urban local bodies. In this case, there is a need of calculation of total requirement of equipments and fire stations on the basis of state vulnerabilities, classification of hazardous industries in both rural and urban areas. Further, the state government should also focus on creating basic infrastructures, for example, fire stations, water reserves which can be used in the events of fire, then there should be proper training structures for the personnel of the fire department. Further, the states need to improve the outreach of the fire services. And in this case, fire stations or fire posts should at least be established right up to the subdivisional level in the beginning and ultimately to the block level and the gram panchayat level. So at all the levels of governance, such outreach of fire services should be provided. And as such, there should be fire stations and fire posts which should be created. Further, these fire services should be converted into multi-hazard response unit. And as such, these services or the fire service personnel can participate in the event of other disasters also. For example, they can be active in case of earthquake related disasters or other natural disasters like the cyclones. So these should be multi-hazard response unit. So the fire service center should be converted into multi-hazard response units so that their capacity can be utilized in terms of fire disasters and also in the event of occurrence of the natural disasters. Now besides all this, there is a need for ensuring community preparedness and the awareness. And as such, there should be proper conduction of mock exercises and also a proper platform should be created which would keep the community organized and trained on a regular or permanent basis. Further, at times it has been seen that there is lack of coordination and accountability and responsibility on part of various departments in a state. And as such, there is a need for fixing up accountability and responsibility for the preparation of fire hazard response mitigation plans and there should be proper coordination and accountability and responsibility between the urban local bodies and the other departments. Now, for example, there is a need for fixing the accountability of the urban local bodies and the electricity department, etc. of a city or the municipal body. And besides all these, the most important thing is the setting up of a proper communication system so that the response time of the fire personnel and the fire stations can be improved in case of occurrences of such fire disasters. So these are few points which can be used in answering the question related to fire disasters if it comes up in your mains examination. And due to the occurrence of various deadly fire disasters like that of Delhi and also one of the events that occurred in Surat, these NDMA guidelines become important both for fire safety and also for our exam. And with this, let's take up the next article. Now, this article on page number 11 is related to V.K. Krishnamanan, who was the former Defense Minister of India and who resigned after the Chinese War of 1962. Now, various contributions of the V.K. Krishnamanan can be important for us from the General Studies Paper 1 under the topic Post-Independence History and his contribution towards India. So, in this, we will try to understand some of the important contributions of V.K. Krishnamanan in this regard and what were some of the controversies associated with him. So regarding V.K. Krishnamanan, you should note that he is considered to be the architect of the non-alignment movement. And regarding non-alignment movement, we note that it reflected India's stand towards the two military blocs that were created during the Cold War era. Secondly, he was considered very close to the first Prime Minister of India, Jawaharlal Nehru. And he was the third Defence Minister of India between the years 1957 till 1962. However, he had to resign from his post after India was defeated during the India-China War of 1962. Further, he played a key role in the setting up of Indian arms industry with the help of Soviet Union. So he was a key player in the setting up of Indian arms industry. Thirdly, he led India's diplomatic mission to the United Kingdom and also he represented India at the UN level. And he is known for his speech at the UN in the year 1957, in which he defended India's position and rights on Kashmir. And at that time, he set a record for nearly eight hour long speech before the UN Security Council. And in this, he defended India's right to the territory of Kashmir. Before independence, 
he got closely associated with the animascent and the home rule movement in chennai and also he served as a secretary of the india league which was a britain based indian organization which was working towards india's independence and self governance now soon after independence in 1947 he was sent to uk as the indian high commissioner now his term as the high commissioner was a bit controversial and an infamous jeep scandal happened during his term as the high commissioner to uk and in this it was highlighted that he ignored the protocols on the purchase of jeeps for the indian army so the two controversial events which are associated with vk krishnamenon are the jeep scandal and secondly it was the india's debacle in the indo china war of 1962 However his contribution has been the participation in the home rule league he served as the secretary of india league and also his role in the setting up of indian arms industry and the most important contribution of vk krishnamenon is that he is considered to be the architect of the famous non alignment movement or the non alignment policy of india in terms of its foreign relations and which has always guided india's foreign policy so these are few points related to vk krishnamenon and these can be important for us from the mains examination under the general studies paper 1 with this let's take up the next article now this article on page number 13 reads that the inner line permit will be provided to the manipur and this has been stated by the home minister of india and accordingly manipur will be exempted from the citizenship amendment bill provisions so this aspect that is what is meant by this term inner line permit and which all states have this inner line permit regime are important for us from the preliminary examination point of view under the topic polity so in this let us first look at what will be the impact of manipur getting the inner line permit and secondly we will understand what is meant by this term inner line permit and also we will understand in which all states is the inner line permit provided now regarding the inner line permit you should note that it is a system which requires the outsiders of the states to obtain a permit from the government to enter the designated territory so if anyone who hails from outside that particular state will have to get a permit to enter the designated territory of the state which has this inner line permit and manipur had been demanding this inner line permit for a while now secondly this inner line permit can be issued for travel purposes solely and the main objective of providing or creating such an inner line permit is that it provides a special protection of the distinct identity and it safeguards for the peaceful existence of the indigenous people of the state and that is why people from outside the state require the permission to enter the designated inner line permit territory now recently the home minister has clarified that manipur will now be included under this inner line permit regime and accordingly let us look at what is the impact of getting such a status of inner line permit for the manipur Now according to the citizenship amendment bill of 2019 if it gets approved this will not apply to the tribal areas of Assam Meghalaya Mizoram and Tripura which are included in the 6th schedule of the Indian constitution and this will also not apply to the states of Arunachal Pradesh Mizoram and Nagaland that are protected under the inner line permit system So now one of the implications of the addition of Manipur to the list of inner line permit protected states will be that The citizenship amendment bill will now only be applicable to some parts of Tripura and Assam. So this means that majority of the northeastern states of India will be exempted from the application of this citizenship amendment bill. So the two points that you need to remember for your preliminary examination are that the amendments to the citizenship act of 1955 will not be applicable to the tribal areas which are included in the sixth schedule. and these include the states or some parts of assam meghalaya mizoram and tripura and secondly it will not be applicable to the states which have an inner line permit system and these are arunachal pradesh mizoram and nagaland now besides the restrictions that are imposed by the inner line permit there are two other permit regimes and these are the restricted area permit and the protected area permit now the restricted area permit is applicable to the andaman and nicobar and that came into news when a foreigner was killed in andaman and nicobar and he was killed while intruding into the area of the sentinelese tribe of andaman and nicobar 
Secondly, the protected area permit is provided for states which have international borders. And accordingly, we will provide you the content related to the restricted area permit and the protected area permit in today's PDF. So please go through that and that will be important for us from the preliminary examination point of view. With this, let's take up the next article. Now, this article on page number 14 is related to first ever Paris summit that is happening to resolve the Ukrainian crisis or specifically the East Ukrainian crisis. Now, regarding East Ukrainian crisis, you should note that Russia had annexed the Crimean Peninsula of the Ukraine in the year 2014. And accordingly, this step of Russia was condemned by the Western world. So in this regard, the French and the German governments are mediating talks to seek an end to this five-year-old conflict in the eastern Ukraine, and which was started after Russia annexed the eastern Ukraine and the Crimean Peninsula of the Ukraine. Now we will look at this article from our preliminary examination point of view. And in this, the first thing to be noted is the name of the summit, that is the Paris summit, and to what is it related. So this Paris summit is related to the Eastern Ukrainian conflict and is aimed at resolving the Eastern Ukrainian conflict. So this simple fact can be important for us from the preliminary examination point of view. And second is the location of the Crimean Peninsula from the world geography point of view. So the point that should be noted is that the summit which is happening to resolve the Eastern Ukrainian crisis is named as the Paris summit. Now another important Paris summit is the climate change Paris summit. So don't get confused with that and this can be asked in the context of the East Ukrainian crisis also. So if you look at the location of Crimea, it is a peninsula which is attached to the Ukraine. And on one side of this Crimean peninsula is the Black Sea and on the other side there is Sea of Azov. So this location of Crimea can be important for us from the preliminary examination point of view. So a simple question that can be asked in the preliminary examination is that which two seas surround the Crimean Peninsula? So you should be aware that it is surrounded by Black Sea and the Sea of Azov. So these are two important points for our preliminary examination point of view. With this, let's take up the next article. Now this article on page number 7 reads that Dr. Bhim Rao Ambedkar was in favor of the Uniform Civil Code and this has been said by the Gujarat Chief Minister. Now this issue of Uniform Civil Code, various pros and cons of the Uniform Civil Code, various Supreme Court cases related to Uniform Civil Code and the Law Commission's report have been discussed in detail in the Daily News Simplified of 1st June 2019. So in today's description and in the comment section, we will provide you the link of that video. So you should go through that video and try and understand the various aspects of the Uniform Civil Code in detail. And that will be important for us from the mains examination point of view. So the purpose of providing the link for the video is that you can go through that video and revise the basic aspects of the Uniform Civil Code and use all these points in your mains examination. And this news article on page number 12 reads that Japan and Australia are still hopeful of India's rethink on the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. Now you might be knowing that India had recently withdrawn from this Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership and various aspects of the RCEP were discussed in the Daily News Simplified of 5th November 2019. So again in today's description and in the comment section you will find a link to this video so that you can go and revise the various aspects of the RCEP deal. Now after going through today's discussion, let us try and answer these questions and the answer for them will be displayed after 5 seconds. The first question reads, the inner line permit regime is present for which of the following states? First is Arunachal Pradesh, second is Mizoram and third is Nagaland. And all three are included under the inner line permit regime. So the correct answer is D, 1, 2 and 3. Second question reads, which of the following states have been covered under the sixth schedule of the Indian constitution? So you should be knowing that there are four states and they are Assam, Meghalaya, Mizoram and Tripura. And accordingly, Manipur is not included under the sixth schedule. And thus the correct answer is B1 and 2 only. Third question reads, recently in 2019, a Paris summit was held and it is related to which of the following? So as we have learned, the correct answer is B, that is the Ukrainian crisis. 
With this, we conclude today's discussion. Now, let's take up the question for the day.